morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Gerlowski. I'm a software engineer at Apple. Uh, and I'm a longtime Solar contributor, committer, PMC member. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today about Solar's path. Um, sometimes it's, it's kind of difficult path towards putting out a, a V2 API, something that's refreshed and, and easier for, for users to kind of take advantage of. Um, so Solar, if you're not familiar, is an Apache project. It's uh, kind of governed by the ASF and, and covered by the ASF license. Um, and it's a search engine that's built on top of Apache Lucene, um, which is, uh, so it gets used for, for enterprise search, e-commerce search, site search, uh, all of these kind of basic uh, text relevancy use cases. Uh, and the, the thing that I think we, we should st start by kind of stressing is how old the project is. Uh, it was created in 2004. Uh, it was donated to the ASF in 2006. And it was, it's been a top-level project since 2007. Um, and with that 15-year history, 20-year history, um, Solar's seen a lot of change. Uh, developers have kind of cycled in and out of the project. Uh, industry kind of best practices and frameworks have changed kind of out from under Solar. Um, and so you can imagine that the API that Solar's accumulated over that long history, over those 15 or so years, um, has, has really kind of grown organically and in a way that maybe hasn't aged super well. Um, you know, how things have happened is if somebody wants to add functionality to Solar, say they want to add uh, some change to the way Solar does backups, and they need to expose a parameter or a new API or something, they kind of have just done what seemed best to them. Um, and you know, we, we haven't, as a project, really set out kind of guidelines or, or conventions for what API should really look like. Uh, and this works well um, kind of for individual APIs. But when you look at the, the whole API surface that Solar offers, things end up getting really inconsistent with one another. Um, so, so let's look at an example. Uh, so first, for a bit of background, if you're not familiar with Solar, uh, the main kind of entity in Solar is a collection. Uh, collections are what you send documents to for indexing. Collections are what you submit searches to to, to get results back. Um, and collections, you know, like any kind of database you might be familiar with, uh, collections have a schema, and schema has, has fields. Uh, so when we look at the two APIs on this slide here, uh, this is how you delete a field in Solar and how you delete a collection. Uh, fields at the top, collections are at the bottom. Um, and just looking at these, you know, they're both delete operations, so, you, so you'd expect them to be relatively similar. But you can see some pretty big differences. Um, you know, we're using different HTTP verbs, post versus get. Uh, the paths look kind of different. Um, the, the top path just mentions the collection name and then schema. So you know you're talking about the schema. But the bottom path, it has some kind of admin path segment. And it's, if you're a user, that's probably not really too clear why this is an admin operation when deleting fields isn't. Um, and of course, one, uh, the delete fields API uses a request body, and the other one has query parameters. Um, so there's a lot of things that are kind of different between these. And it's, it's really hard to tell from, you know, if you're familiar with how to delete some things in Solar, there's no way to intuit kind of how to delete other things. There's no consistency between these APIs. Um, and this isn't just about, you know, kind of making things look nice. This actually matters. Um, the, the problem here isn't consistency for consistency's sake. Uh, it's, it's really that consistency is, is important because it's a, a, a key part of usability. Um, you know, if, if your API is all over the place, it's going you know, it's, it's to be really hard for people to actually use. Um, and eventually, people won't use it because of that. Uh, they'll, they'll go find some other project. Uh, so consistency and usability in these ways, they impact adoption. They impact the reputation that your project has. Uh, it just has such a, a huge, huge impact over time. And so if you look at the, the inconsistency we have in our APIs and you look at kind of the impact that that has, the conclusion you have to come to is that Solar has an API problem. Um, and that's not a knock against Solar. Again, this is kind of a, a natural um, kind of follow-on or a natural consequence for, for being as successful and long-lived as Solar is. Any project that's been around 15 or 20 years is going to have some technical debt they need to take care of. Um, so the fix here, if you're in the Solar community or you're a user and you, you want to see this get fixed, is for Solar to put out a new set of HTTP APIs. Um, hopefully something that lives kind of in parallel with what's there, so users have time to, to migrate. Um, and so that's something that the Solar community has considered. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today, Solar's attempt to get new HTTP APIs out there. Uh, to clarify, I just want to kind of mention some things that this doesn't cover. Uh, a lot of people have problems with, with Solar's query syntax. There's a, I mean, to, to be frank, it's, it's a, a pretty arcane syntax, how you specify queries and how they get parsed. Uh, 
how you specify filters and how fastening happens, all those query parameters. Um, there's definitely room for improvement there, but that's kind of not the scope of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and similarly, if you look at Solar's uh, Java client, SolarJ, um, again, lots of room for improvement there, lots of things that could be fixed, um, kind of not in our scope for today. We're just going to focus on the HTTP API specifically. Um, so again, improving these APIs has actually been something that's, that's been recognized really early on in the community. Um, there's been a lot of Jira tickets that have kind of tried to take this up in part or in whole. Uh, some of these go as far back as is 2009, so really only a few years after the project was open sourced. Uh, it's, it's an absolute age ago. Um, and the, the first effort to really kind of take off in a big way was Solar 8029, uh, this, this attempt to modernize and standardize Solar's APIs. And you can see this, this maybe stands out from some of the other tickets on this slide because this is the first one that really kind of looked at uh, taking on the, the APIs as a whole and putting forward a replacement, um, not just for a, a single kind of part of Solar's functionality that's out there, but for the whole API service entirely. Um, and so this ticket, this Solar 8029, was uh, actually kind of a, a huge success for the project, at least at first. Um, there was tons of engagement. There was tons of feedback on the ticket. There was you know, upwards of 80 comments. There were probably 18 or 20 people involved in kind of uh, providing feedback on this. And a, a lot of the comments were really kind of substantive critiques. So the community was really, really engaged, which was helpful. Um, so the, dis the discussion went on for a long time. It, it went from 2015 to 2017, so two years of going kind of back and forth on what this API should look like and how it should be implemented. Um, and at the end, it actually produced a, a working V2 API, which if you have followed Solar over the years, you're, you're probably a, at least a little bit familiar with. Um, and it broke ground on, on some conventions that kind of live to this day. Um, like we, we do offer the V2 API kind of in parallel to, to Solar's V1 API. And we separate those with a kind of a, a context route. So traditional Solar APIs are available under slash Solar. And the V2 APIs, as shown on this slide, have a slash V2 uh, kind of prefix to them. And so Solar's, Solar's users can kind of take advantage of these um, interchangeably. Um, so th this was a huge success. Um, you know, we, we have a V2 API out there. Um, but unfortunately, that's not the end of the story. We're not just kind of done. Um, while we had this V2 API that was available somewhere around 2017, um, there were problems in, in how it was kind of structured, what the endpoints looked like, um, and, and really kind of how it was rolled out. And, and so the story from here is that over the next three or four years, from, from 2017 to 2020 or so, what started out is this really promising um, kind of up and coming new API um, just kind of started to, to backslide more and more over time. Um, and, and there's a, a number of causes here. Uh, but I think a big contributor is that the effort to get the APIs out the door um, took so long and involved so many people that towards the end, there's, uh, there's very little gas left in the tank to, to finish up some of the kind of foundational things that were needed to shore up this API. Um, so take documentation. The, the documentation ended up being um, maybe not as, as full as it could have been. Um, there was no real dog fooding of the API. Um, once the API was out there, it wasn't really used by Solar internally. Uh, there were very few tests that were kind of switched over to use this. Um, none of the, the tooling that Solar shipped with really used this V2 API. Um, and that really set it up to, over time, you know, changes were introduced. And since we weren't using the V2 API, we didn't notice when things broke. Um, so things fell into disuse. Things fell into to bit rot really r relatively quickly. Um, and the V2 API kind of became more of a maintenance burden than, than kind of the promising next new thing for the project. Um, and so uh, you know, a big part of this, as I said, is the lack of docs and tests and kind of usage of the V2 API internally. Uh, but there's also kind of a structural element to why V2 really kind of fell off after the initial in introduction. Um, and I think what we in the community saw time and again was that while the V2 endpoints uh, for some particular functionality worked great at first, they'd, they'd get worse over time. Uh, people would make changes to the underlying functionality, say, say backups. That's kind of an example I'll come back to. Uh, somebody might add functionality to, to backups, and they would change the V1 API because that's kind of where the, the application logic lived really close to the, that V1 code. Um, but the way the V2 code was structured, it, it lived kind of further off. And so the, the V2 API would you know, kind of end up not getting updated when these functional changes would get, in, would get made. Um, and this is really kind of a, 
an artifact of how the V2 API was implemented. Uh, when V2 initially came out, it, it was kind of written as a translation layer on top of the V1 API. So when users would submit a V2 request to Solar, when they would send a, a V2 API call, uh, Solar would translate that into a V1 request and then run the V1 request. Um, and the, the application logic really lived with the V1 code. That's, that's the little symbols I put in the block here. Um, that's our, our application logic. And, and so you can see that if that logic changes, it's relatively natural to update V1, but then V2 kind of gets left behind just because of the way that that's structured. Um, and I'm sure you can imagine there's a, a pretty obvious fix for this, and that's to kind of switch where the application logic lives. Um, if the application logic lives close to your V2 code, um, then it's, it's much easier to keep your V2 API up to date. Uh, you know, I think that's relatively clear. Um, but the problem is, is that with Solar's V2 API, the, with the framework that it was written in, um, it, it wasn't really possible for, for our, our V2 API logic to, to be close to the application logic at all. Um, and, and the reason is that the, the framework that we wrote our V2 API with was actually not code, really. It was uh, in JSON files. The, the, uh, the framework was kind of written as this thin shim that would uh, define the V2 API in JSON and then kind of have a, a translation to, to translate. You know, this JSON would specify, OK, maybe this parameter is used for V2, but then it needs translated to this for V1. Um, and it'll be because this is a JSON file, it's really hard to put your application logic close to this. It's always going to have to be kind of at a distance from the actual functionality. Uh, of course, another problem with a framework like this uh, is it nobody really understands how it works. Um, you know, there's, there's probably two or three people in the world that, that understood this code when it was added to Solar. Um, and so if you're somebody who wanted to make a V2 API change, you're, you're forced to understand this framework that um, very few people understand, that you can't go to Google or, or Stack Overflow for, for answering questions. Um, and, and so it just adds a lot of friction to keeping the V2 API up to date. E even when folks realize that they should be updating the V2 API, there's a lot of barriers to actually doing that. And so this, th these are all kind of reasons why it, it fell behind. So after watching this dynamic play out for, for quite a long time, the, the community eventually realized that we needed to come up with a new framework for our V2 APIs. Um, and so for a, a time, we used kind of a, a homegrown framework that used Java annotations similar to what's on the slide. Um, but we're, we eventually decided to move to, to kind of a, a known off-the-shelf framework. And what we have here is a, a framework called JAXRS. Uh, is anybody here familiar with, with JAXRS? OK. Um, JAXRS, it's a, a relatively popular framework. Um, and the idea is that in JAXRS, you, you have kind of uh, semantically significant uh, annotations that are attached to Java methods. And these kind of define what the API actually looks like and how you actually call it. So here we have a Java method. It has some inputs. It has a return value. Um, and you can see from the annotations, you can kind of get a, a pretty good picture of how this is actually invoked from an end user perspective. We have an annotation for the path, for the HTTP verb. The method parameters have annotations that determine kind of how, where those values get pulled from and how they get populated. Um, and the API response is actually just the return value from this method. Um, so it's, it's a relatively intuitive framework once you've seen it a, a few times. Um, so with, with kind of the switch towards this framework, um, it's, it's, really, uh, it's easier to make sure that our V2 APIs don't fall behind. Uh, because it's easier to put the application logic either in this method or close to it. Um, and, and of course, using kind of an off-the-shelf framework reduces some of that friction and some of that um, kind of documentation burden on the project to, to make it clear how the framework actually works. Uh, you know, a anybody that has a JAXRS question can go to Google. Um, so of course, these have all been kind of changes in the framework of, of how the V2 APIs work. Um, but We've also been tempted towards making kind of more, um, I guess, cosmetic changes as well towards what the APIs look like. Um, you know, we, we put these APIs out there in 2017, and it wasn't long before questions started coming up about why they looked the, the way they did. Um, you know, we have a lot of delete operations, like we talked about, but they all use the HTTP post verb. Why, why is that? There's a, a delete verb that we could use just as well and would probably be more intuitive for folks. Um, a lot of our APIs use kind of this slash collections path and then kind of do some, uh, some command ar around there. Um, could we kind of make better use of different paths to help differentiate different operations? 
Um, and so over time, we kind of accumulate a lot of these questions and a lot of these kind of proposed um, cosmetic changes to our APIs, in addition to, to the framework kind of questions we, we already talked about. Um, and so we get to a point as a community where we need to decide, you know, how are we going to tackle these? We already have kind of a V1 API in solar, and we already have a V2 API, and we have a bunch of changes we want to make to V2. So do these changes need to go in as a V3? Can we modify the, the V2 APIs in place somehow? Um, and in short, we, we came to a question of, of backwards compatibility. You know, what, what kind of guarantees do we want to make around the V2 APIs, and should we, we be allowed to change them? Um, so in general, Solar's backwards compatibility policy is, is pretty cut and dry, and it, it follows kind of a convention that a lot of projects out there use. Um, so if you have an endpoint slash old and you want to replace it with some new endpoint slash new, uh, there's a period where they have to overlap. Um, so from when slash new is introduced, you deprecate slash old, and then you leave slash old around for kind of the remainder of that major release uh, cycle. Um, so here in this example, let's say we introduce slash new at 9.2. Um, so 9.2 forward would have this slash new endpoint, uh, but slash old would be deprecated at that point and would continue to live around for 9.3, 9.5, 9.11, um, and then it would be removed in the 10.0 release. That would kind of be the first one that doesn't have it. Um, in, in general, this is a policy that works really, really well. Um, it, uh, it, it gives kind of our, our users a guarantee that things won't change. If they write code to integrate with an API in 9.1, they're going to know that it's going to be there in, in 9.10. Um, and given kind of how long roller, Solar's major releases tend to be, you know, this is a pretty good guarantee. The, the 8x release line was, was open and was getting releases for two or three years. Uh, but of course, from a developer's perspective, all this overlap is kind of a, a duplication of effort. Um, there's a significant overlap in, in red here where the community has to maintain kind of both the old and the new. And this isn't just kind of having the code sit and live in your Git repo. This means responding to test failures, uh, fixing documentation or bugs that customers report or, or questions that they might ask on your user list. Um, there's, there's really kind of a non-trivial debt with, with kind of this overlap. And you know, obviously, this, this makes sense for V1 because we want things to be stable for our users. But we started to ask the question, does it make sense for V2? Uh, and the answer that we ultimately came to is that, um, you know, ultimately it doesn't. The V2 API, uh, maybe not, uh, maybe it wasn't announced this way, but really it was kind of in an experimental state. Um, the, the APIs needed changes. They were already broken, as we've kind of discussed. Um, and they were never really documented or, or used, so it was really impossible for anybody to be using them. Um, so. In effect, what, what we did uh, several years back is we kind of announced our V2 APIs as experimental. Um, and it, it turns out that when they were initially put out there, there was already kind of this mention of them being experimental and iterated on in subsequent releases. Um, but really reaffirming that experimental designation has allowed us to iterate on them much more, much more quickly. Um, and the, the experimental designation, I think, does two things that are really important for us. Uh, the, the first is that it's really kind of sent the right signal to users that, you know, you, you probably shouldn't be using these APIs quite yet. We're, we're still kind of honing them and refining them. Um, and the second thing, obviously, is that it lets us make changes to them without kind of strict concern for backwards compatibility. We, we still try our best to uphold that, but for the V2 APIs, um, we, we don't kind of hold to it as, as strictly as we might otherwise. Um, in hindsight, it's something we should have uh, stressed much more as, as soon as the V2 APIs kind of went out the door. Um, so now we, we have all these cosmetic changes, and now that we've kind of reaffirmed that, that our V2 APIs are experimental, um, we need to actually go and, and implement these cosmetic changes that we've been considering. Uh, and the, the more kind of we, we had the freedom to step back and look at the whole set of, of API changes now that we were experimental, the more we realized they were all kind of steering our API in, an, in the same direction. Um, and that was to, to really realign around the, the idea of a RESTful API. Um, this is something that, that had come back as come up as early as 2017, uh, when we were kind of initially proposing the V2 APIs. But for for whatever reason, the endpoints that we ended up going with didn't really fit most people's definition of, of what REST really kind of meant. Um, and so, if you're unfamiliar with a REST API, you know there's there's a lot of debate about kind of which which features of REST are um, I indispensable and, and required for calling yourself a REST API. But in Solar, these are kind of the ones that we focused on specifically in our kind of realignment of, of the REST APIs. 
Uh, so we want to frame our APIs conceptually as, as resources. So the, the paths are generally nouns that um, as different path segments proceed, you know, kind of get narrower or more specific. Um, we use our HTTP verbs semantically. So when you're deleting a resource, it should use the HTTP delete verb for that API. Um, and as much as possible, we, we try to avoid any kind of uh, RPC style calls. Um, Solar has a lot of functionality where that's hard to avoid entirely, but for, for 80, 85 percent of our APIs, we're, you know, we, we are able to, to tweak that and, and kind of avoid uh, kind of straight RPC style things. Um, so when we realized that this was kind of the direction that we were going, that we were going for a, a true uh, REST API as much as possible, uh, we really kind of uh, wanted to, to figure out what this meant for everything. You know, if, if we're realigning around kind of a, a paradigm and, and kind of declaring that uh, more fully than, than Solar had before, let's make sure we do this consistently across all of our APIs. Um, so what we really had to do is kind of list out in a spreadsheet all of the APIs that, that Solar offers. Um, you know, what functionality is there? Uh, do they currently have a, a V2 API? Um, what does that API look like? Is it RESTful? Does it need changes? Um, and, and so we had to come up with, with kind of this, this large spreadsheet. Um, and, and this was actually kind of about a year ago today on our uh, Ritter around kind of buzzwords. And I, I remember it pretty well because it, it ended up being kind of a difficult process um, because there's a lot of solar functionality that doesn't fit the REST model super easily. Um, a lot of the solar resources kind of have interesting relationships to one another that, that don't map super easily to, to what you normally see in REST APIs. And backups are a, a good example that I'm going to call out again to here. Uh, when you create a backup in solar, you're creating it from a specific collection. So in some ways, backups are kind of a, a sub-resource of that collection. Uh, but for any other backup operation that you want to do, it's, you, know, you don't really need the collection at that point. Um, you can list backups. You can delete backups once the data has been copied to some other place, um, kind of e even from a totally different solar cluster. So that the original collection that it was created from is, is kind of less important at, at that rate. Um, so we had a decision to make for the, the create backup API. You know, do, you, do you want the backups to be kind of a sub-resource in terms of the path um, under collections? Or do you want to have the collection name when you're creating this backup just be kind of a, a required query parameter? How much do you want to kind of emphasize that, um, that connection between the two? Um, so there's a lot of hard choices like this. I, I think we ended up choosing the second one. But uh, the, the point here is that you know, we had these hard choices to make, and we had to find a way to make them as consistently as possible kind of across the whole code base. And laying things out with this large spreadsheet was really helpful for doing that. Um, another thing that the spreadsheet really stressed for us was really the size of our API surface. Um, so when we, we finished the spreadsheet, it, it turns out Solar had upwards of, of uh, I think, close to 250. 45 uh, APIs, which is a lot, a lot of discrete kind of chunks of functionality that needed to be kind of fit into this new model and, and that we would need to make changes for. Um, and, and of course, not every API needed changes, but a lot of them did. Um, so having a, a better understanding of, of kind of the scale of this work really kind of shifted our focus from, um, you know, just the few committers that were active on this, maybe trying to, to go through as many APIs as they could themselves. Uh, to really being an effort more focused on enablement. Um, you know, we, it was never going to get done if it was just a few committers trying to convert these APIs. We needed kind of the, the whole community to, to really kind of come forward and, and kind of help divide and conquer the work. Um, and so that's, that led us to really kind of focus a, a lot of our time on this kind of enablement effort and, and really on kind of documentation in our issue tracker. Here's a, a list of tickets here. And you'll notice they all have a label called uh, new dev. And what the new dev label is, if you're not uh, super familiar with, with solar development, it's a, a label the solar community uses to try to identify tickets that are good for new developers to the project. Um, and typically, these have kind of really extensive documentation. There, there should be kind of step-by-step write-ups. Uh, and so for all of our kind of API work that we were going through, we, we tried really hard to get the new dev label on these. Um, so all of these have, again, kind of a step-by-step -step write up for, for how to actually make the changes. A lot of times they have links to example uh, GitHub PRs that are annotated, not with review comments, but with kind of explanatory comments for why particular changes that have been made. Um, and of course, on these new dev tickets, a lot of people have kind of volunteered their time to help with any questions or with, with anything that comes up when a, a new developer picks these up. So we, we really kind of focused hard on uh, enablement here. 
Um, and this, this also spilled into kind of in-person sessions, not just uh, asynchronous documentation, but really kind of offering to, to meet with folks online, you know, on Zoom or, or Google Hangouts or, or whatever, um, and really kind of help people get involved in the solar community. Um, and so we held a, a series of contributor workshops this past year uh, where we started at the be very beginning, helping folks learn, you know, kind of how does the community work? What does the development process look like? How do you set up and build the project? Uh, all the way through kind of pointing them at it may be some good areas to get started in. And of course, we kind of highlighted the, the V2 APIs uh, is one of these. Um, and these were, were generally pretty well received by the community. Uh, and so what we've seen uh, kind of as, as time has gone on is that these efforts have been super, super successful. Uh, we look at Solar's V2 APIs, and we've had 41 that were kind of improved in some way or another by contributors that are totally new to the project, uh, people that you know, weren't there six months ago. And so you know, we, we said Solar has uh, 200, 240 APIs. So you're, you're looking at like 20% of the changes that need made being done by people who weren't there six months ago. Um, so this has been hugely successful. Um, and, and it turns out over half of the, the V2 kind of improvements that have been made in the last few years have, have come from these new contributors. So it's been um, uh, just really, really successful to, to kind of focus on this enablement. Um, to hit this point just a, a little bit harder, I, I have a graph here of um, kind of conversions to our, our JAX-RS framework that we're trying to move to. This is kind of an ongoing effort. And you, you can see there's, you know, the, the first several months that I, I was tracking this, you know, there's a, a relatively consistent uptick here. We, we convert five or 10 APIs a month. Um, and then between May and June, you, you see a big uptick. And it's, it's tempting to think that that's maybe some, some conference-driven development. Um, but really what it is is that some of these first-time first contributors who had been around the project now for, for several months had really gotten their feet under them and started to be much more productive and have a much bigger impact on the project. Um, so in this graph, I, I kind of see um, really kind of this enablement work really paying off. Uh, so it's been a, a huge, huge success. Uh, so that brings us up to kind of where we are today. Um, I've tried, let, tried to highlight a lot of the bumps in the road that we've, we've kind of gone through getting this API to where it's really ready for users, uh, but we're still not quite there yet. Um, there have been structural problems, there have been cosmetic problems, and we're still kind of working our way through those. Um, and hopefully I've kind of shown how the community has responded to these. Um, and so we've started a lot of these initiatives. We're, we're moving to a JAXRS framework. We're realigning things around kind of a, a, a restful design, and we're still making some of those cosmetic changes. Um, but these, these are all kind of ongoing efforts. They're, they're still kind of in progress. Um, so if you look at the road ahead for the V2 APIs, a, a lot of it is kind of following through on the initiatives that we've started. Um, so we still have uh, 100, 120 kind of V2 APIs that still need change in some form or another. A lot of these are very small cosmetic changes. Uh, a lot of these are kind of larger switches over to the, the new framework. And then there are some V2 APIs that are missing altogether. Uh, we talked in the beginning about how sometimes after the V2 API was, was introduced, it kind of fell behind V1. And so we, we have these gaps now where V2 APIs need kind of uh, written from scratch, essentially. Um, so we have some way to go even just to reach parity with V1. Um, so once we've squared those things away, though, we'll, we'll be able to start looking at kind of the, the next steps and some really interesting things to do with our V2 APIs. Um, and one of the ones that I'm most excited about is integrating with kind of an ecosystem of, of tooling and specifications called OpenAPI. Is anybody here familiar with, with OpenAPI? Okay, a few folks. Um, so API, OpenAPI kind of at its core is a, a specification or a way of describing your API. Um, and that can be human readable, but it, it's also uh, machine readable. And the idea is that if you kind of uh, describe your API in this way, then there's this whole set of tooling that you can kind of bring to bear around, uh, around your project and around your API. Um, and so one thing that we're starting to do in Solar is we have tooling already. Um, there's, there's tooling that can look for JAXRS annotations. So as we move to this new framework, uh, this tooling will look for these JAXRS annotations, and it can generate the open API spec for you. Um, so before, in our kind of original V2 API framework, we were generating this, this kind of burdensome, uh, self-defined API spec by hand. Um, 
But now that we've moved to JAXRS, we're able to define a, a similar spec kind of automatically through a, a Gradle task. Um, and once we have that specification, it, it ends up being a, a JSON file or a YAML file. We're able to run it and, and do a lot of other things with it. Um, you can generate web UIs with some of this tooling. If anybody's heard of Swagger UIs, these are kind of, um, I, I guess, interactive uh, website docs to let you kind of uh, read about and understand what APIs do and ultimately even submit uh, and, and format API requests. Uh, there's also tooling, and this is kind of one of the ones that I think is most interesting, that can take this specification file that you've produced um, and generate API clients from it. Um, so Solar traditionally has only had a, a Java client called SolarJ. Um, but with this move towards JAXRS and by integrating with, with some of this open API tooling, we'll be able to offer um, clients in a lot of other languages uh, somewhat for free. You know, we aren't going to have to maintain uh, these clients by hand like we do with SolarJ. We'll, we'll be able to kind of generate them automatically and make those available to users. Um, one last thing that I kind of wanted to highlight about open API. Uh, is some tooling that, that actually lets you compare different versions of specs. Uh, so with each release, we, we can produce an open API spec, and we can use that to detect any breaking changes that we might not have noticed in that release. Um, so it's also kind of a, a defensive setup that, that allows you to um, kind of catch changes that your, your users might run afoul of. Um, so there's a lot of really cool functionality that this move to JAXRS and this integration with open API can hopefully really bring to our users. Um, of course, the, the last kind of final uh, road to cross for us is we get V2 um, kind of up to parity with, with V1 and ready to replace it, is deprecating and ultimately removing the, the V1 API. And for Solar, I think this is still kind of several major versions out there. Um, but we've kind of started discussions for what this might look like and, and try to get ahead of it. Uh, Solar has a process called Solar Improvement Proposals. Uh, and that's kind of how you navigate large changes in the Solar community. Uh, and we've, we've started one of these for, for eventually deprecating V1, even though it's, it's some time out. Um, so those are some of the big things coming up for, for Solar and for its V2 APIs. Um, so to sum up, kind of building an API that's, that's cohesive, that's easy to use, and um, maintainable as well, it has been a really, really hard project for, for the Solar community. Um, there's a lot of things that we ran into in terms of pitfalls, a lot of things that went wrong. Uh, and, and hopefully, kind of hearing about those can, can serve as, as lessons to folks who are going through um, similar processes in other projects, even. Um, a lot of these lessons learned are not maybe specific to APIs or even to solar. Um, so things like expecting iteration. When you put out a, a big new feature like our V2 APIs, you really should stress the, that that's experimental up front and kind of expect work to be ongoing in terms of improving those. Um, Another thing that I would kind of hit again is, is that the structuring of your code matters. Um, for us in Solar, our V1 and V2 code was structured so that nothing uh, really enforced that V2 stayed up to date, and it was very much an out of sight, out of mind um, kind of dynamic. Um, and, and so, you know, you, you really want to structure your code so that that can't happen. Um, another kind of lesson learned for us was, you know, there's, there's really no need to, to reinvent the wheel, to, to write our own APIs frameworks. Um, it, it might seem quicker at first, but ultimately it's going to be more cost in the long run. Um, so that's a lesson that we kind of learned the hard way and that I think everybody knows, but it's hard to keep in mind. Uh, and the last thing I'd really kind of stress is that many hands make light work. If you have a big change like this that's, you know, parallelizable the way that small API changes tend to be, um, you're really going to be best served by enabling folks in the community to chip in with that. Um, so you can really kind of take it, make the most effective of your open source community. Um, one or two people working on something is, is not a great way to, to get things done quickly. Um, so that's everything that I had to talk about today. I'm happy to take uh, questions or, or talk after, maybe. Does anyone have a question for Jason? Hey, Jason. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I just have one question. Uh, why didn't you, like, have you considered using something like a gRPC API or something like that? Uh, because uh, for two reasons. One is 
REST clients don't have like the parameters documented very well. So over a period of time, the uh, it's kind of hard to know what parameters exist and it's kind of hard to make backwards compatible changes uh, with the REST API, whereas with gRPC, it's much more better. The second advantage is you get the clients for free uh, in all languages with the gRPC API, which makes writing automation much more easier as opposed to a REST API, which is challenging in some sense. And it seems like you're tr kind of trying to go in that direction anyways with JAX-RS, open API specifications, Swagger. basically that's the whole, that whole stack is gRPC, right? The next step is auto-generating clients and once you do that, then that's pretty much like what gRPC gives you out of the box. Um, yeah, I mean, I think to, to your point, that in terms of documenting parameters, in terms of kind of auto-generating clients, a lot of that does sound very similar to the advantages of gRPC, but in, and there were discussions about, you know, kind of if we're, if we're redesigning the V2 APIs, if we're considering something fundamentally new, should we go with, with a different paradigm like uh, gRPC? Um, and, and I think people wanted to stick close to, to REST, primarily because it was closest to what we already had. Uh, gRPC does have a HTTP endpoint, and you can actually send the JSON in G, like you can actually send JSON formatted messages just like here uh, in gRPC frameworks with the HTTP endpoint. You can for sure. You can make gRPC calls over HTTP, but my understanding is the structuring and kind of the the conceptual alignment of those endpoints are, are generally different. Generally, a gRPC API even over HTTP looks conceptually different from a, a REST API. And I, I think the community felt that we were already somewhat close to, to REST. Uh, obviously, there were still a lot of changes needed. Um, but I, I think that's why we ended up going with, with kind of in the RESTful direction is because people felt like it would be less change overall and was also you know, a relatively popular option. It's not like REST is um, um, kind of outdated or, or unused. You know. uh, does that answer your question? <laughs> I tried my best, sorry. We can talk more after. Hi, Jason. Um, it's Charlie. Uh, just to, uh, the people that came in new to the project, the new contributors, which I think was a, you know, a great um, output of this process, a side effect, um, do you know what they're doing now? Are they now contributing to other parts of Solar? Are they still engaged? Or has there been a kind of fall off after this initial bit of work? Uh, that's a great question, and that's one of the things that I'm kind of most curious about going forward is how many of these contributors who came, you know, maybe because we nudged them particularly to work on V2, how many of those stuck around and worked on other things? Right now, it looks like it's kind of a mix. Some people just did one PR on V2 to try things out and, and kind of went away, which is totally fine, you know. Um, but there have been some people that have stuck around. Um, I can think of at least two or three folks who have made kind of PRs to a, a variety of different areas in the code. Um, some of them pretty, you know, pretty significant. Uh, we had a new contributor kind of update the version of Lucene we're using, which is obviously kind of a very low-level change, um, and that has the opportunity to impact a lot of the code. So it's it's been kind of a mix. There's a, a spectrum of how involved these new folks have gotten. Um, but yeah, obviously I'm I'm hoping people continue to be involved, but it, it's kind of a mix. Thanks. Any more questions? All right. Now we all. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for listening, guys.